Hello everyone. Um, this roundtable is on the Facebook Giphy case. Uh, for those that do not know me, my name is Anouk van der Veer and I'm a second year PhD researcher here at EY and one of the DCI Young Scholars, working on dynamic competition and how to account for it in competition law. We're very grateful to have this uh, great panel of experts. On my left we have David Bosco, Professor of, and Director of the Center of Economic Law of the Faculty of Law and Political Sciences at Aix Marseille University. We have Mike Walker, Chief Economic Advisor at the Competition and Markets Authority, Professor at King's College and Visiting Professor at the College of Europe. And on my right, we have David Foster, who we will, who will we call Dave now, as we have two Davids, um, who is the Director of Competition Practices at Frontier Economics. Over to you. All right. Um, so, we're going to try our best to make the panel as interactive as possible, which means that you're going to have to express uh, some opinions and, and vote. Um, so the structure of the panel, maybe I, was, I would start there. Um, we will discuss three different topics. The first one is the actual case, right? So what is the case, the Facebook Giphy case, in case you did not follow? What's the analysis? That will be step one. Step two, we will be discussing um, the dynamic issues that we see coming out of the case, right? So we try to take a step back and also put this case into perspective with other cases that may be of interest when you want to study dynamic competition. Step three, we will take two step backs and study which would be the implications on, of all of those cases and what is the framework that we can put so to make it very practical and workable for the agencies. Now, we do have three votes one per step, and I will actually start there, and this will inform what you think, and probably the members of the panel may react. So for you to vote, it's very easy. You have two options. Option number one, yes, it works. Um, actually, let me use this one. You can take a picture of the QR code, and it will get, get you straight to the vote, um, or you go to slido.com and on the front page they will be asking you for a code. The code is DCI. If you do that, you will get immediately to vote number one. The first question is the following. What you would have ordered or would you have ordered Meta to sell Giphy like indeed the CMA did quite recently, right? And you can answer only yes or no to this question. Um, Please keep the web page on your smartphone and computers because this will be the very same link in about 15 minutes for the second vote and the very same link in about 30 minutes for the third, right? Uh, we will, I will come back to the results, give you a few um, minutes so you have the time to, to think about it very carefully. Um, in the meantime, we'll introduce the very first um, subject of this panel and I'll give you back the floor, Anouk. Yes, so, so let's start with the case itself to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, Mike, would you like to guide us through the facts of the case? And let's try to keep it short, three minutes. Sure, okay, three minutes. Oh, wow, so it's five. Um, look, so, I mean, this is a little bit parochial in one sense, we talk about a specific case done by a specific competition authority, but I think it is a nice example of uh, or vehicle to talk about some of the important issues. You know, I, I got the very strong impression yesterday and also this morning that there's a lot of people who think competition authorities don't care about innovation, don't think innovation is important, don't understand about the capabilities approach, and, and that's so far wrong. However, we do need help in being able to use the learnings from the academic literature into cases in relatively short time in a coherent way. Um, okay, so I'm obviously speaking on, in my own capacity, not on behalf of the uh, CMA. I'm not going to say anything remotely controversial, so that's not an issue. Okay, very quickly, facts of the case. So Facebook, probably heard of it, social media company, but obviously basically an advertising company. Very strong position in display advertising, so that's basically all non-search advertising. In the UK, about 50% by revenue. Google, the only other significant competitor. Facebook wants to buy Giphy. What does Giphy do? Giphy produces GIFs, which are these sort of sh short, soundless, looping videos that you can add to your messages. And they also produce stickers, which are sort of transparent. Um, uh, so Facebook wants to buy Giphy. Giphy is a business model, was that it was going to try and earn, turn 
gifts into advertising revenue by allowing brands to, to effectively align themselves to ticket gifts that they would then pay to have in the Giphy search engine when you're looking for gifts. So that's called paid alignment. They'd rolled it out in the US, semi-successful. However, they, the, the internal docs were clear. They thought it would be successful. And then they're talking about introducing it into the uh, UK. After Facebook bought Giphy, they stopped that, that paid alignment entirely. Okay, what was our concerns? Well, in one sense, it's pretty, pretty standard concern. Well, actually, step back. Innovation is clearly the most important thing for economic growth. Static efficiency, all very nice, but it doesn't actually drive economic growth. Innovation is what drives it. We know that. You know, some of us have been making the point that competition policy is not good at that for the last 15 years. So it's not that we don't know this, it's that it's difficult to do. We also know that most GAFAM mergers are entirely benign. They're mergers of complementary products that clearly have uh, efficiency attached to them. You know, and, and we also... There's a lot of research on that. So we understand that. Fine. The harm in this particular case was that, effectively, Facebook wanted to, to buy a, a potential competitor. So standard horizontal competition concern, but it's dynamic. And, and here's an important point. And this goes something David said yesterday. At no point did we even suggest that we thought Giphy was going to, going to replace Facebook in advertising, or even that Giphy would, would be successful. You know, that's absolutely not for us to say. What we did argue, however, was that the act of Giphy competing in that space, that dynamic competition, in itself has benefits. In itself would spur Facebook to do stuff. And again, look at the, we, we get to look at the internal documents. There's evidence of this. Would lead Facebook to be more innovative than in a world in which Giphy wasn't there. So we're not trying to say, yeah, of course Giphy is going to replace Facebook and Facebook you know, is a kill acquisition in that sense. No, we're just going to say there was valuable competition that would be lost. So anyway, so last 30 seconds, we blocked that merger. Okay, one thing to say about that is I have to say I did laugh when Joe put up a slide, his first slide after Tiago's presentation and the first point in Joe's slide was this shows Tiago's work, this shows that type 1 errors are really costly. And I'm sitting there thinking, type one errors? We've had more than a thousand GAFAM mergers over the last 20 years, not a single one blocked. I defy you to find another sector in which that is true. So, of course, in individual cases, it's difficult. But the idea that we've got an excess of type one errors when we're now a thousand to one rather than a thousand to nil, I afraid defies common sense. And I'll hand over. Thank you very much. In the meantime, we have the results and we can see that the crowd here does not agree with the CMA. 74% um, would not have ordered Meta to sell Giphy and 26% would have. Okay, um, Facebook also didn't agree um, and appealed before the Competition Appeal Tribunal. Um, Dave, could you walk us through the appeal? I mean, I, with those results, I'm not sure I need to say anything. I should, I should you know, just say, you're sort of very wise, you know, uh, I agree. Um, um, and I will say this, I, I mean, uh, you should discount everything that I say, because uh, to give the, the, the usual academic disclaimer, uh, you know, I have nothing to declare other than I'm completely biased. You know, I, uh, I work for Meta, you know, they are paying my mortgage, I'm not going to pretend that they, that they don't. So, um, so I'm, you know, I, I inevitably come at this in a slightly one-sided uh, way. Um, but, uh, you know, what I will say is this. I kind of will, I reserve my criticism, I would say, on in this case, more for the court than for the CMA. You know, the, the CMA comes to this thinking, you know, you know, what Mike said, you know, a lot of these mergers go, you know, there's been very little enforcement, you know, here. We should take this stuff seriously. There's a, you know, they had the Furman report. You know, they, they, there was almost there was a there was a policy shift that said mm, we, we we should we should be doing more enforcement here. Um, and you know, not just is the balance of type one and type two errors sort of you know are we getting that wrong, but also I think uh, a belief which can be totally rational, right? The, the belief that that type maybe type ones and 
uh, and not very expensive. You know, that, that you can, it, blocking a merger doesn't cost humanity very much, potentially. You know, the two businesses will carry on doing their thing. Uh, but type two errors, you know, oh, what if Instagram, what if Instagram had been the big competitor to Facebook? You know, that, that kind of thinking, that, that type two errors, on the other hand, are very costly. So, you know, if you, come, if you come to enforcement with those beliefs, which may or may not be right, uh, then, then being quite strict on something like um, Facebook Giphy is potentially rational. But um, that is not CMA's job, right? It's not there to make policy because it's an arm's length body uh, designed to enforce the law. There's a big democratic problem in an, an independent regulator making public policy about what we should do with the tech sector because nobody elected them and government ministers are not allowed to interfere in their decisions. So maybe we will get legislation in the UK and it will be passed by Parliament and then there will be, you know, regulation of, of digital platforms that has democratic legitimacy. But in the meantime, CMA is not allowed to make policy. And this is where the court should come in. Because the court's job is to say, OK, I understand you've got all these policy objectives, but are you enforcing the law and have you done a good enough job? Um, and this is where I think Competition Appeals Tribunal in the UK got it so wrong. I mean, it's the, I think it is the worst court judgment I've ever read. Um, and in some senses, that's, you know, not that it's easy because most court judgments you read, you think this is fantastic. What clear eyed, logical people. This is not one, you know, where you think that. And what does the court say? It says, you should, if you're going to think about dynamic competition, you should have a framework. And I think the whole purpose of this conference is we, you know, is that we all agree that you should have a framework. And it says CMA hasn't really set out a framework, um, but that's not a problem. First mistake. If your regulator has not set out a framework, step one, block, you know, overturn their decision, send them back and tell them to come back with a framework. You know, but they didn't do that. They said, no, it's fine. They have not set out enough of a framework, but it's okay because we can just make one up now. You know, we will just write down some stuff in our decision that is a framework uh, for dynamic competition. And they do this in like 10 paragraphs, like less. Um, big problem, because the court is not competent to set out that framework. Um, I mean, maybe it would be, you know, if it, if it happened at that particular moment to have the world's leading experts on dynamic competition sat there in the tribunal, but if you read what it wrote, you will not come to the conclusion that that's what it had. It had people making it up on the back of a fag packet is what it had. Um, and it is poor. As an undergraduate essay in dynamic competition, it's, you know, this is an F. Um, and that's why the court should have sent it back and said, give us a framework, give us a proper framework. And you know, what did it do instead? It said, well, oh, well, first you should look at static competition. Right, okay, but this is a framework for dynamic competition, okay. But there's no issue in static competition. CMA says there's no issue in static competition. What should you do next in this framework for dynamic competition? Did you think about potential competition? But guess what, CMA says there's no issue in potential competition either, or at least that's what the court finds. Um, so that's not, you know, so that's also, in this specific case, pointless. Then you should think about, well, what's the time frame for dynamic competition? Well, okay, yeah not today and a, and a bit in the future it's an easy question so that that part of the framework is also kind of pointless um and this is oh, you should think about what the merging parties are trying to do in this area okay yeah i, I agree you know that's fine um and then you, you should identify in broad terms what is the dynamic element of competition again like Yes. I mean, you know, imagine, imagine saying that that was the framework for assessing static competition. Oh, you should broadly identify what it is that these people are selling at the moment in their shops. It's like, well, well yes, you should. But, you know, when do you get to the bit that is the assessment of competition? Then it says, aha, we have got the big answer now. This is the big build up. You know, we've, we've done this all preamble stuff. But now there's the core of the framework. What is that called? It's like in the judgment, it's like whimsically called duds question mark like are you joking me this is what the court is saying you you should do you should sort of whimsically ask yourself is this a dud and and and, and then it gives a list of, of i think really quite random factors that you should think about 
to say, well, basically, is this, is this potential dynamic competitor going to be successful in some way? Like, can it be monetized? You know, is it, you know, it, 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 has it got a business model? Okay, it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. That's fine. But when do we get onto the point where we assess the extent of the potential competitive constraint that this thing could exercise? And the answer is never. It's just not there in the framework. So the court has just totally duffed it up um, and has left us all, at least in the UK, with a big problem, which is, you know, if that is the framework, the CMA can do whatever it wants on these cases because there is no judicial constraint whatsoever. And that's a big problem. I mean, it, it, it sort of is and it isn't, right? Because the CMA is very wise and it's got great people who are trying to do the best thing by the UK economy. So, you know, trust them and let them get on with it. It's, it's not going to be that bad. But the end of the day, you know, to kind of slightly misquote Warren G, regulators are going to regulate. So, you know, somebody has got to constrain them because the big issue here is these are very innovative markets. Um, and somebody has got to stop the regulator saying, do you know what, I would just love to tinker with this. And I would just love to put my hands around what's allowed and what's not allowed. And that is not the way it works. You know, this is... For me, so much of the theme of this conference so far is all set out in what Hayek said about the meaning of competition in 1946. Competition is not a state. It is a process of discovery. And that, you know, that's the thing that we should be trying to protect. Yeah, Dave, I'm afraid you are already discussing what we want to discuss in part two of the discussion. Um, you can make what you want out of it, but the vote actually changed. Uh, so now it's 29% of the people in favor. So Maybe you try, you convinced a few of the people in the room. So keep on voting, uh, but uh, Anouk, back to you. Yes, so now that we know how we reached the framework, um, what is the framework actually? David, do you want to guide us through um, how the CMA understands dynamic competition? Oh, do I have to say something about the case itself? No, 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 just how, how, how <laughs> dynamic competition is understood. <laughs> Um, okay, so I, I'm not a professor, I'm not an economist or enforcer, and I, I, um, I, I would try to take the dynamic competition seriously uh, with all my heart, but also I have simple questions. Um, and um, I understand that we need to adapt our competitive analysis uh, in the presence of in evolving markets and um, I value this um, initiative to und understand the, the dynamics of the, of the market. So you're asking me about the, um, how does uh, one analyze the um, limitation of dynamic competitors, um, competitive capabilities in Europe. And in antitrust matters in Europe, and in the interest of time, I will focus on maybe only one example um, that seems to me to be the most topical uh, of the issue of the treatment of agreements by which a company pays to uh, limit the competitive capacities of a uh, competitor. Um, so we have here, uh, even if it's quite hard to draw a line between potential and um, dynamic uh, competition, uh, and that's part of the discussion, in the CMA um, decision. Uh, we only have material on com potential competition in Europe, and we have this long recognized principle under EU law that um, we have focus on conduct on the market of an actual or potential competitor, that's the Schuker uh, unique case. And I have in mind two cases, um, concerning pay for delay agreements at the generic uh, case and the Lugenbeck case, the first one in 2020, the second one in 2021, and both involved these uh, reverse uh, payment settlements include transfer of value by uh, originator drug companies to prospective generic entrants. So the question here was, can agreements between undertakings who have never competed in the same relevant market be a uh, classified as restriction of potential competition in breach of Article 101. And 
the case law is interesting for our, our today's discussion because the um, standard here is that potential competitors must have real and concrete possibilities to enter the, the, the market and compete with the uh, undertaking established uh, in that market. So talking about mergers now uh, that involve dynamic competitors, this part of the test, real and concrete possibility seems to be relevant um, as well. But my question is, can, can we do it without a serious assessment of potential uh, competitors' capabilities. So the, uh, this discussion we had about capability seems to be key in, the, in, in that kind of, um, uh, of discussion. Another important criteria here is the inherent ability to enter for the potential competitor. And once again, it's about capabilities. The firm intention to enter, that's the third one, the time frame of entry, so um, in these cases about pay for delay agreement, what we can see is that we need a serious assessment of capabilities of potential entrants to, to penetrate the market. And I think that when it comes to merger, that might be uh, relevant as well. I just have a second short comment. Am I good with the, the timeline? Yeah, you have one minute. One minute, wow. Yeah. Okay, i have tried to. Um, the second comment would be, would we have the same case in, in Europe, uh, the same case then, the um, same case about Facebook and, and Jiffy. Um, I'm, I'm not sure of that. Uh, we do not really have material on dynamic competition. We only have something in the, the merger guidelines. But we are currently um, branding new tools in, in order to, um, to catch killer acquisitions. The, at least two um, tools we might use. The first one is a new interpretation of the merger regulation um, regime, aiming at catching that kind of, uh, of mergers. And the second one is the application of Article 102 on abuses of dominant position. And in these two bodies of rules, uh, the standard is the same. Uh, the standard is to analyze the existence of a substantial impediment to competition. And once again, uh, I believe that in order to interpret this standard of substantial impeding of competition, um, an assessment, a serious assessment of capabilities of potential entrants is key. Otherwise, what are we going to talk about, yeah, given the, the, the competitors are not present in the market? Thanks a lot. That's a perfect segue to part two of the discussion. So what we want to do now is to leave the Facebook Giphy and try to see if that case can actually teach us something when it comes to dynamic competition. Um, comes the time for vote number two. So again, I'll put the QR code on the screen. Uh, if you have it on your cell phone, you could just refresh the page. And the question now is which cases, it's more tricky, which cases are most useful for studying dynamic competition? Um, so feel free to enter the name of a few cases and we'll see if you mentioned the ones that the panel will mention in a few minutes. And in the meantime, that brings me to you, back to you, Mike. So the question is, um, what, what issues regarding dynamic competition you think arise from the Facebook Giphy case that will inform your work at the CMA in the coming month and the coming years? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think the, the general point I want to make here is that the issue here is all about decision making under uncertainty you know, and how do we best do that so we know that GAFAM produce fantastic products we all use them and we know that dynamic competition is the most important aspect of, of the economy in terms of getting us sustainable long-run growth um, but we also know in fact Bowman said it yesterday that you know Firms who have very significant rents, you can categorize those in three ways, Schumpeter and Ricardi and maybe Monopoly. And the same firm may have a mixture of those and it may have a mixture of those that varies over time. And so we, we're already operating under some sort of level of uncertainty there. Then as competition authority, we have a balance of probability standards. So we are told, right, here's a merger. Are you more than 50% sure that 
that merger is going to lead to harm to competition, in which case you have to block it or remedy it, or not. Now, historically, competition authorities have treated uncertainty really, really badly. They've said, oh gosh, this is uncertain, oh I don't know, fine, do your merger. As if that's avoiding making a decision. Okay, and if we want to see an example of, why that, of where that was bad, just think of Google DoubleClick. You know, that's a truly terrible merger, and we're really suffering the, the pain from that 15 years later through you know, the ad tech stack and what a mess that is. Okay? So, <clears throat> it's, it, in an uncertain world, you can't just say, no, we're, we're going to abdicate our responsibility and not make a decision. We still have to make a decision. So we have to do that under uncertainty, with, with time constraints, with the best tools available, and that's where merely knowing that dynamic competition innovation is really important, or merely knowing, as we do, you need to think about capabilities, is a starting point, but it's only a starting point. You know, and one of the things I think David said yesterday is actually look, economics has, has failed in this area. You know, and I agree, and I've been saying this for longer than I've had this current job, which is 10 years, which is, as an economics profession, we have failed to provide regulators with a good framework for thinking about innovation concerns. Okay? So this sort of initiative we're talking about here is fantastic if we're going to get those tools, but you really do have to help us. Because it's not that we're blind and obtuse, it's that we are doing a, okay, self-serving here, a difficult job under significant constraints and we, we need help. Okay, I think I'm going to say one more thing, if that's okay? Um, so, one more thing is, um, in a world of uncertainty, you don't know what's going to happen, incentives are really important. You know, understanding the firm's incentives and therefore understanding what their business model is, you know, how that's going to impact on their, their behaviour. Again, I think that's something competition authorities have historically been a bit poor at doing. I don't want to go at lawyers, but I think lawyers have been a bit poor at understanding. Incentives are evidence. If you understand the incentives of firms, that tells you something important about how you think they might operate. You know, and again, that's something we're really trying to bring to the fore in the CMA, and I think the Facebook Giphy decision does that, but again, it, it's, it's difficult. I'll stop there. Thanks a lot. Before I give you uh, the floor, Dave, I just want to mention, so the results of the vote are very instructive, and as you mentioned indeed, uh, Fred, yesterday, I think we have now enough case law for the lawyers also to be part of the discussion. Most of you, and I've made it so that you can see the results of the vote, will mention Dow Dupont, which is not too surprising, I suppose, and some others will mention the Microsoft case, and there are also references to OpenAI, right? So more looking at the outside the agencies. Um, what, I, what I see in the case law is that there are three ways by which the court will mention innovation and consider innovation. They are not doing it when it comes to market definition, at least not the EU courts, but they are sometimes doing it when it comes to market power, right? That is one, um, which is not something that those cases will uh, discuss. Second, they may do it when it comes to harm to innovation. This is what most of those cases will do here and most of what you will indeed have in mind, apparently. And the third might be to justify a practice or justify a merger, right? So loss of efficiency, but good for innovation. Therefore, I will actually give you a free pass. Uh, and we have very few cases doing, doing this. So the question back to you, Dave, is pretty much the same. What do you think we can learn from that Facebook Giphy case? And how do you see the framework evolving in the coming month? I mean, I, um, I would start by saying I really strongly endorse you know, what was said yesterday about the importance of taking a capabilities approach. Um, and, it, and in a way, I think, although we might not all agree with the outcomes, I think Dow DuPont and Facebook Giphy are actually steps in that direction. That, you know, these are cases that actually start the beginnings of talking about, uh, about capabilities. Um, and I think that's, I think it's really important and I suppose the question is, why is that important? Capabilities, in my mind, one of the things that makes them different to products as a frame for assessment is a capability can be both a complement and a substitute at the same time. And that is not true of products. Product is either a complement or a substitute. Depends what the cross-elasticity of demand is. You know, you, so you, 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 
you know it's one or the other when the product exists. The capability is not true. Capability could be a complement, could be a substitute, it could be both at the same time. It depends how you use it. Um, well, so Giphy is a great example, right? So Giphy taken by Facebook is a complement. That the capabilities they have, that's a complement because you can just enhance the social media experience using that complement in the right way. In the hands of somebody else who thinks I want to take on Facebook in advertising, it's a substitute, and the, and the CMA looks at it and thinks I see a substitute. Um, now, what's interesting, particularly interesting about this case, is taking that product and using it as a substitute, you actually kill some of the complementarity, right? If you make this an ad-funded model um, that kind of puts Pepsi, you know, at the top of the list when someone searches for a gift for, like, happy, you know, I'm happy, and it's, it's someone holding a can of Pepsi, actually makes the gift product worse, right, for the user. Because what, what I want, uh, I, I actually wanted to see Rachel from Friends at the top of the list or something, you know. And I got Pepsi, and I don't want, you know, it's, it just makes my communication worse. And it's sort of, yeah, it's frivolous in a way, but also this is how humans are now talking to each other. This is like fundamental to, to our existence that we communicate emotions like uh, through these things. And that's like, re it's really important. Like, you know, if I think about like my parents' generation where the solution was we just do not communicate about emotions at all. <laughs> um, so, you know, so this is a genuine trade-off and that's, I think that is the space where this has got to go. It's why the capabilities approach helps so much is forget, I, I, I totally agree with this idea of putting it, the idea of efficiencies in the bin. You know, we, th that has so failed, you know. Where is the case that's ever been cleared on efficiencies? It does not exist. You know, it's, it's a kind of regulatory joke, right? Get rid of that idea of ex-post assessment efficiencies. You've got to bring it right into the core of the analysis. These capabilities, they are, you've got to sit there and say, what are the complementarities? What are the potentials for substitution? Which world do I want and which world is going to be better for, human, for humanity in a way uh, and for consumers and make that trade-off in the core of the analysis of is this a competition problem, not as an afterthought for efficiencies. That, so that, that's where I think it, 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 it should go. Um, you do that assessment and then, you know, and then I think you, 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 know, you need to do an assessment of scarcity as well. You know, how, how scarce are these, are these capabilities really? And you know... Again, take it back to this case, a GIF. What is a GIF? It's like a little animation, you know. Who's got the capabilities to do that? Well, I can tell you one person, that is my like 13-year-old daughter, she can do it. Um, she makes them all the time. So, you know, you, there's a bit of that as well that needs to be sort of brought into the assessment. But I, I think, yeah, capabilities is absolutely the way to go. Thanks a lot. We actually, when we prepared the panel, discussed whether using GIF was a thing for old people and whether or not the teenagers were still doing it. Uh, but we may have some question related to that later on. There is one answer I need to highlight. Someone answered just a dot. Another person said known, right? Um, another answer, which I think is, is good, is the Microsoft, I mean, good, that I enjoyed is Microsoft GitHub. When you see, when it comes to innovation, you really have to, in my opinion, make a distinction between you need access to some infrastructures or assets or skills in order to be able to innovate. The other one is you need access to certain channels so that you can actually spread the message, right? So it's more about the adoption than the technique itself. And the Microsoft GitHub may be on the first category, so very interesting case. Uh, now it's time for part three of the discussion. So we take two step backs and actually try to put some proposals on the table to make the framework workable for the agencies. Um, so that leads me to the third question that I want to ask you. Where do you think dynamic competition has greater chances of integrating the agency's framework? So do you see agencies, and also based on the discussion, putting innovation first or considering dynamic capabilities when it comes to merge control, maybe Article 1 or 2, or Sherman Act Section 2, or collusion, whatever you think. Uh, so you can hear votes, uh, and it, also, you have an option to vote for the policy making. We give you some time, disclose the results in just a minute, but in the meantime, I give the floor back to Anouk. Sorry. Yes, yeah, so we have one uh, final question before we go to the more fun questions. Um, do you have any ideas on how to improve the framework, so to, how to make it more uh, workable? And we can start with David. Um, well, 
how to make the, the, the framework workable. Um, I don't want to spoil the party, but I, seri I have serious concerns about the way we are implementing uh, these new theories. Um, talking about the, the Facebook and Giphy case, uh, especially, um, I, I'm convinced that assessment of capabilities of dynamic innovators might be a, um, a very good thing. But um, I'm, I wonder whether there is not a mis misunderstanding about this, uh, <laughs> this theory of dynamic competition. I, I thought it was a way to mitigate the um, intervention of regulators with, uh, on the market. And now I discover that it's something else in order to justify an intervention in cases where weak competitors might somehow uh, compete with uh, incumbent and dominant players. And to me, it's at the case in the Facebook and, and, and Jiffy case. Well, we are talking about a, a developer of an application showing short videos with people doing funny faces. Is it innovation? We had this discussion about the notion of innovation yesterday. Um, I don't know what innovation is a mystery, but I, I don't know what an innovation is, but I, I know what it's not. And gifts are not innovation. And talking about competitive constraints, um, that's something Mike said, but um, I, I don't see Jiffy uh, as a, comp a serious competitor for, for Facebook. So, and I, I don't want to be too, provocative, but a good way to improve the framework to me would be to apply dynamic competition theories to the intervention of regulators. They have to pay attention to the um, dynamics of a market, fast moving markets, what is going to be the outcome of enforcement on these dynamics. And um, talking about the remedies as well, uh, now we have a few years of background on the implementation of the or the discussion of the remedies. Is divestiture a, a good remedy in that kind of a market? Wouldn't be a penalty or a fine uh, appropriate somehow, but what is the outcome of the case? They are going to divest, give you, but who is going to buy it? Um, so a, a good way to integrate that, the framework, in my view, wouldn't be to, of course, it's interesting to have that kind of theories in the assessment of a, a merger, but also it would be interesting for the regulators to pay attention to dynamics of the market when they intervene on the market. Oh, sorry. Just one thing. I don't know what Freud would say about that, but I blocked the vote, so you cannot answer, right? Uh, it's now available for you to vote, uh, so please go ahead and... And we will be asking the policymakers, actually, what you have to say about that, because I think it says a lot. Okay, we have the same question uh, for you, Dave. So how can we make the framework more workable? I mean, I, um, I would, the main improvement I think I would put forward is we need to spend, you know, and it, it echoes what was said yesterday, we, we need to spend a lot more time on the supply side uh, in these cases. And in particular, you know, I, I'm building a bit what, what Mike said, you know, it, incentives, you know, when that supply side analysis, like incentives matter enormously and understanding of those incentives, we need to get a lot better at that. Um, and I think, you know, I would disagree a little bit, I think, with what Pierre said yesterday about entry and being quite skeptical about the prospect for entry to deal with competition concerns in these sorts of cases. And actually, that, that same skepticism you see in the in the face, Facebook Giphy decision from the CMA, they say, well, they say um, entry entry might happen, but we don't think it would be sufficient to um, to kind of replicate what was there from from Giphy. And that is answering, in my mind, an effect question, not an incentive question. Because if the entry happens, that changes incentives. And, and whether it's enough or not then depends on how those kind of incentives wash through the system. And the problem is there is a presumption in the way competition policy is done that is a static presumption, which is entry, you have a merger and then there's a merger effect. 
and entry will never be enough to undo the merger effect because if it did, it would put you back in the position you were before the merger. And if you're back in the position before the merger took place, you know that entry is not worthwhile because that's the situation you're in today. And if it were worthwhile, it would have already happened and it hasn't. So in a static world, authorities are perfectly entitled to say, no, of course, entry is not going to come in and offset the merger effect. Because you, if you bring uh, what I want is for you to bring me back to the state of competition that exists today and nobody wants to enter today, you know, or and if they do, they're already going to do it. So, the, you know, it's not an offsetting effect. That is totally different in the dynamic world. This is the this is the whole flaw at the, at the core of the Dow DuPont decision at the commission, I think, where it spends very little time thinking about, well, if, the, if I'm doing four to three in innovators and I'm basically just taking one of the four innovators off the table, but the prize, the future prize of competition in this market that doesn't yet exist is still there. If I take somebody off the table, why on earth? Does somebody, is it not the case that somebody else also comes to the table and says, oh, there are four seats at that table, you know, five years from now. And at the moment, only three people are going for those seats. Um, and that is very, very different to the static world where you think, well, there are four of us sat here and I'm going to bring two of them under common ownership. Is there room for a fifth? It's like, that is not the question. The question is not, is there room for, for five? The question is, is there still room for four? if you've taken one of the people off the table, it's a, a fundamentally different question. Um, and so we need to, I think, take that whole issue of the, the competitor reactions, which you know is, is sat there in the merger guidelines as an important consideration. Um, we need to take that much more seriously because right now it's sort of a footnote. Um, and that is static thinking, you know, that the, the competitor reactions is nothing more than a footnote. Um, so yeah, that's I would say it's the big the big build for me. Okay, we're gonna make it a bit more dynamic and not ask Mike the same question. Um, we're gonna ask you the Slido question. So where do you think dynamic competition has a greater chance of integrating agency frameworks? So it's either merger control, collusion, monopolization, or policy making. Okay. Um, well, the answer is merger control. Yeah. Um, I've definitely merge control. So can I answer the previous question quickly about about you know about because you know I, I have three very quick comments about where it could it improve. One, and this is entirely on competition authorities. Competition authorities have got to and Dave made this point. Have got to stop talking about efficiencies, and uh, yeah, you show us efficiencies, we'll take them into account. Where that just doesn't happen. Okay. And you know we we impose much higher burden on companies you've got to show your efficiencies with a hundred percent likelihood and quantify them but us no we just got a 50 percent standard okay we can take this under uncertainty that's just wrong we must take efficiencies or in dynamic competition world complementarities much more into account okay that is entirely a failing on our part second capabilities approach okay this is now i'm going to put this onto you you know whenever we we see papers talk about capability approaches and i read them my colleagues read them we all think yeah obviously but how do we do that in, in the time frames that we're dealing with? And so that's an area where I think there's lots of scope for improvement. And then thirdly, and this is a slightly parochial one, um, the competition authorities still agonise over market definition, even when we talk about dynamic competition, which just makes no sense. So if we could have a rule that said in any mergers involving innovation or dynamic competition, you are not allowed to put the words market and definition together, <laughs> I think that would be a significant public policy improvement. Um, okay. Going back to, to mergers, your question, why do I think it will have more effect in merger control? Because you know, I think in merger control is where we are taking decisions in real, relatively in real time about the structure of markets and where there's real scope, therefore, to do harm quite, in quite short time scales repeatedly because you know we get loads of mergers in all the time and i think that's that's where therefore there's real benefits and potential costs of not getting this right are there any questions from the room Nicola? so i i have uh, one question for mike and
it's about this figure that often comes out. It's about type one errors, like, you know, 1,000 mergers, zero blocks. I mean, isn't this like a little bit of a tricky, you know, way to dismiss concerns of type one errors because these numbers look like or sound like big numbers in absolute terms, but we tried, Bo tried to show yesterday a slide with the number of new firms added in ICT industries. I'm gonna recall this number because that has to be the baseline over which you can realize whether that number is a big number. The number is in 1978, when I was born, we had, can you hear me? In 1978, the ICT industries, a small subset of ICT industries we studied had 20K firms, 20,000. Today, the in, these industries have 150,000 firms, right? So even if all these mergers were killer acquisitions, that would be less than 1% of the entire, you know, sub-industries that we're studying that would have been taken out. So isn't this too easy to say, you know, 1,000 mergers, zero block? I mean, you know, in a way, you know, I would say good job. I mean, you know, I don't think that's because of concern. So, you know, if we talk about real numbers, um, you know, what's your view on that number? I mean, can you reconsider or tell, tell us how we think about this? Yeah, okay. So, so the, the thousand uh, figure is just about mergers within GAFAM. Okay, so uh, it's not about the whole, whole population. Um, but more substantially, look, I don't really get this understand why people are saying that we don't care about type 1 errors. I mean, that's a really odd thing, I think, for people to say. Of course we care about type 1 errors. We're just making the point, I'm just making the point that we also care about type 2 errors, and where we're looking specifically, you know, it's, I agree it's only one statistic, you take a broader perspective, that's also clearly really important, you know. Um, if you're just looking at GAFAM, at those large platforms, you know, we have, if we ignored Facebook Giphy, we clearly made no type one errors, you know, um, but if we go on the other side, you know, there's reasonable arguments. You might say that um, Facebook WhatsApp, slightly dodgy merger, Facebook Instagram, slightly dodgy merger, maybe not, but at least reasonable argument. Google double click, 100% definitely a bad merger. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely not saying type one errors are not, are not costly, because if type one errors were not costly, merge control would be super, super easy. The answer is no, you know. That's not how we do merge control. Or? Uh, thanks. So I have a question and a comment. Maybe I'll start with the comment today. Um, so about the point about democratic deficit and the mandate of competition authorities, um, I would contest <laughs> the way you characterize it. Um, I think if you look at the history of the New Deal in the US, so why do we have independent authorities if you look in the UK from the 70s, why they were separated from the governmental branches is not just to enforce the law, it's actually to make policy uh, and more specifically to make dynamic policy. I think mean, the idea is, and the CMA especially has a mandate to make policy, to make it dynamic because the legislator cannot uh, react as fast. Um, there is of course a democratic deficit issue, but it is solved by having more transparency, accountability. And I think the CMA actually is one of the, best authorities on that, um, on those fronts, at least. Um, the question for Mike, um, I mean, I, I don't know how much your liberty to share, but what kind of evidence do the CMA find decisive? I'm not asking a specific case, but in general, what kind of evidence or type of evidence do you find decisive to prove things like um, that the process of competition has its merits? So that more economic, is it more of a qualitative um, type of evidence? Um, and kind of biting on your plead for more academic research. So what kind of research do you think is missing? And especially when it comes to mergers into the tight timeline, how do you think that should go about or is there a kind of mechanism that the CMA employs for that? Thanks. Um, okay, well, I'm really glad you picked up on, on Dave's comment about CMA is not allowed to make policy. Um, I agree with what you say, um, we, we do make policy uh we issued some new uh merge control guidelines uh last year which specifically talk about the issues i've been talking about you know around uncertainty around dynamic competition um uh, around things like capabilities um you know that that effectively is making policy we do that all the time um why do we think there's what's our evidence of being 
value in the process of competition. Okay, so I don't think in any case we're going, we are looking and saying, okay, it's a process of competition, let's work out how valuable it is. We know that process of competition is super valuable. Okay, we know that it's competition that leads to, to innovation. And then obviously there's a feedback loop, you know, what those innovations are then has an effect on, on competition, can generate more competition. So we know that. So what's the evidence? The evidence we're looking for is actually that there is a process of competition that will happen with the merger but will not happen absent the merger because there's no other firms who will re replace that competitive constraint or whatever just to follow up with this so there's a presumption that the process of competition is beneficial and in a way you want to find evidence to contest it yeah there's a presumption that the process of competition is beneficial i mean if we if we lose that presumption i think we are lost so you need to prove the opposite, not prove that the process of competition is beneficial in this specific merger. Well, we have to look at whether there is a process of competition that will be harmed. We are not going to look at whether the process of competition per se is a good thing or not, because it is a good thing. Anna? You can go maybe first. Okay, I David. Follow up. Um, uh, Mike, I, I wanted to commiserate with you about the difficulties of decision making under uncertainty. But I think economists make it harder for themselves because we focus almost exclusively on incentives. And you pointed out incentives are correct, are important. I would agree 100%. But it's more than incentives. It's a lot more than incentives. It's got a lot to do with strategy. So connecting to what David was saying, um, a capability can become a substitute or a complement. Often it's strategy that determines whether it's going to be a complement or a substitute. So the economists always say, throw the hands up in the air and say, well, we can't really deal with this stuff. Well, that's correct. If all you look at is incentive. But if you look beyond incentives, there are often answers. There's often answers in not just uh, capabilities, but but also in the institutional environment and, and also the general um, uh, the, the overall goals and, and passions of, of the leaders. Uh, these things are hard to get your hands around, but that's not to say we shouldn't start working on the human dimension and the leadership side if we're going to really understand what's going on. So that's my only comment. Okay, can I respond to that? Look, I mean, I think, look, I agree with you entirely. I agree with you that economists can think about these things too narrowly, uh, and it's really important to try and understand the the overall business strategy and the, the business thinking and of course internal documents can be incredibly valuable for that and we use that but they're not a perfect substitute for that understanding so our main point I want to make here is that one of the things we've been trying to do at CMA is to over the last few is to recognize yes it's not all about economics you know uh that's why we now have a data science team with uh getting on 50 people in it that's why we are specifically if anything what you mentioned David talking internally about actually should we be thinking about getting in quite different type of people to help us so the type of people you're talking about who will be much more thinking about strategy and the sort of business school stuff which <clears throat> economists tend to miss you know certainly economists of my generation i mean that's just a different world to us you know and um and and i agree competition authority should also have those capabilities and we are thinking about how we might get hold of those capabilities. And of course, in any particular case, you know, we talk to people with those capabilities externally, but of course, those external people almost always have some sort of skin in the game. You know, so you have to think about those biases when you think about what they're saying to you. So there is an argument for saying that competition authorities should have those skills internally. Um, yeah, it's a fair point. What we're going to do, and I'm going to ask you to keep it very short as you go to Anna, unless you don't have a question anymore, Wolfgang, Bill, and then we keep it there. Thank you for this interesting panel. I have two questions, one for me and one for David. Um, you said that uh, your theory was based uh, more or less on the loss of potential competition. And I wanted to ask you, I mean, one could think that in any case, when you have an acquisition of, uh, you know, a potential complementary player, that would always be a loss of some uh, competition there. So is there a threshold? Like, we can think of this parallel story of the CK telecoms and, you know, that maybe you need a minimum barrier or a minimum loss, so to say, of competition. So that's for Mike. 
And the second point, um, picking up on the thing that you said, David, about the remedies, and if the teacher is a good remedy in this case, um, I was thinking about um, the tower cast uh, judgment that we have. You mentioned about killer acquisitions as well. And their advocate, uh, General Kokoch, said, oh, it's good now that we can use Article 102 as well, because there we have behavioral remedies, and behavioral remedies are great, because then we can use them in this killer acquisition. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. That was my question. Okay, so, so very quickly, um, yes, there's, there's a threshold. Obviously, a merger that, that removed competition between A and B, but there's loads of competition, static, dynamic, whatever, between A, C, D, E, F, G, et cetera, is not going to be a concern because there's enough other competition. And even you know, where there is lost competition, yes, there, there is a threshold, um, but uh, don't ask me what it is because uh, it's, it's, is there a significant lessening of competition? There's, there's case law on it in the UK. That case law suggests it's a really low threshold, you know, you might be concerned about. Um, but yeah, there has to be some sort of threshold. Yeah, thank you for the for the question. Uh, I assume that behavioral uh, remedies would be possible as well under major um, control. But m my point was really to have a, a in-depth analysis of the impact of the remedies. And in, in that case, precisely, I don't really see the point in asking Jiffy to, to be uh, sold to someone else. Um, that, yeah, I, I really would like to understand the reason why th this particular remedy would be relevant. Yeah, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wolfgang, again, please keep it dynamic. Very briefly, in an unusual question, what really are the costs of prohibiting this merger? Because uh, I think uh, Facebook would always be capable of doing it itself. So it, so what does it really cost the society and also Facebook that this, that this merger has been prohibited? I'm not quite sure about this. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question. And I think it, it connects in my mind with this, I think also a really good challenge, which is, you know, do, is, don't you want your competition authority to be, to be making policy in, in this space? Because they're very, knowledgeable and you know and they're great high quality people and well, all of which i agree with right um and I, so i would come back to in the end what what hayek said competition is it is the process of discovering things that you do not yet know so you are aiming it forget equilibrium you know I think, you know, so Brian said, forget equilibrium. Forget the idea that people have information and make rational decisions. Competition is a process of discovery of the unknown, finding out the ways of giving people what they want. Who could have predicted that stupid little animations drawn mostly from kind of sitcoms and other TV shows would become the way that humans decide to communicate emotions to one another? like who would predict that like it's just you know so I, I sort of have a lot of sympathy with what Phil was saying yesterday like privilege the capabilities the development of the capabilities because the capabilities will be the things that enables humanity to answer the questions in the future that it does not yet even know that it needs to ask right so what's the type one error what's the cost of the type one error it is that it is that you you neglect the capabilities that, that actually, you know, the other myth is that these, that these big tech firms know what they're doing. They don't. The more I spend time working with these guys, the more I think the process of innovation is a whole bunch of people throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks. That is what they do. It's what Amazon does. It's like, well, let's try everything. Amazon has a hairdresser in London. They run a hairdressing salon in London. Like, why? Because why not? You know, just try it all and and see what works. And and they don't. They genuinely don't know. So so what do you want? If that's the way innovation happens, what do you really want as a society? I would say what you want is this: you want some firms who hold an enormous number of capabilities, and you want them acquiring as many new capabilities and throwing them at the wall and seeing what sticks as possible to discover where the complementarities are, to discover where you, the new services are that you can create. If you stop them, 
that will just not happen. And society then just stops. You know, the, the, the problem with the DMA is it ossifies, it's, it, it, it operates under the fiction that the boundaries of the firm today just coincidentally happen to be in the right places. And then we say, everybody, will you please just stop and stick to doing what you do now? Um, because otherwise you're going to be self-preferencing. And, and, and that just operates under this lie that we know where the boundaries should be. We don't. Nobody in this room knows. The firms themselves don't know. It is a process of discovery. Uh, if you stop that, it's a massive social cost. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. So we go for the last question, Bill. It's quite a political statement, right? It's talking about spaghetti in, in, in Italy. But anyway, we'll come back to that. Uh, Bill, we have one minute left, so it gives you a sense of... Uh... Uh, I like this format very much. Uh, I think that this is worth replicating in other settings where you take a specific uh, episode and look at it in some detail and try to draw larger uh, implications from it. So I would do this in other areas. Uh, I'd have other case studies. Uh, as Mike was saying, I'd, I'd look at Google DoubleClick. I'd ask why did the FTC and the European Commission, after a very detailed study with all kinds of really smart people, I was one of them, decided uh, to let them go. Uh, that's worth examining, not simply to uh, uh, reconstruct uh, the actual decision-making process, but to try to probe what was interesting to the agencies, why did they cast aside certain information, uh, the, the, real, the real key there, uh, ex post, a lot of people said, yeah, that was a mistake. Ex ante, not so clear. Uh, and what, what would you know, what would you want to look at taking account of some of the considerations we mentioned to do it better the next time? I think, I think ex post reconstructions are very useful. And one other thing that Mike said that I think is part of this picture, the capabilities focus is very useful in thinking about how agencies should be constructed and how should they should operate. Uh, I think Mike put his finger on it. What kind of capacity do you need inside of an agency to do this kind of work well? Uh, the data team, the science team that Mike referred to, 50 people, no other agency on the planet is even close to making that kind of investment and in trying to get their arms around these kinds of issues. That's an investment that may not pay measurable results for five years, 10 years, 15 years, but a necessary experiment and investment if you're supposed to be doing this work. I think a useful complementary question in looking at how the analytical framework should be is, what do you need inside an agency to do it well today? What should you build for tomorrow? How should the design of the agency evolve, change? How does dynamism affect that over time so you can do these judgments? Well, uh, whether, whether you like individual CMA decisions or now, it is the only agency in the world today that's made more than a nominal investment to doing this right for the future. Very grateful for you putting the institutional question on the table. I have a very final question. Who has sent a gift in the last uh, seven days? Could you please raise your hand? Just a couple of people. Um, I would just put Giphy on the, on, the, on the screen. It's such a big, beautiful screen. I can't resist that. So in case you've never seen a GIF, um, you get a chance to. Uh, but please join, join Anouk and I in uh, uploading the panel.